learns to play an instrument, learned a second language, applied to college, applied for a loan, started a business, started a blog, shared a picture, shared a moment. Turn your wish list into a checklist with Internet Essentials from Comcast. When you're connected, you're ready for anything. Hello. He could shred metal harder than any of these knuckleheads with the, the big beards and the tattoos. I have heard the people criticize me, and I have to admit, I agree with them. I think it was probably inevitable for me to make work that was about what was going on around me. I think as an artist, you really have to kind of challenge those boundaries. I have complex regional pain syndrome type 2. I mean, after the accident, his body hurts. I just want the pain to go away. You get an ID with a mind roller. Exposure therapy is basically introducing the individual to their memories. Virtual reality is kind of an augmented exposure experience. We spend our time saying that music is connecting us to the world. And the most inspiring place where youth is embracing this music is in China. Yes! in the conversation about, um, you know, it's not necessarily the best actor, it's the right actor. For me, digesting that kind of alleviated a lot of anxiety. It kind of just made me think more about like the journey that we're on Gosh, and like booking the room more than like getting the job and focusing more on that aspect of it rather than trying to be like perfect for the role and trying to be perfect in every single tape. Just trying to be the best that I can be and to show that in everything I do. One of the many, many things that was helpful for me was the list of what to have to do a self-tape. Just discerning um, what is manageable right now, what's next and what's really usable. It was just really great. I felt like I was in really good hands. It never really occurred to me to view it as like starting a business with a marketable product. It's just exciting and um, just thinking about it as like an entrepreneur and I never viewed myself that way before and so that's like really powerful and em empowering. I really appreciate that. If you had a role you were really only auditioning people that lived in Los Angeles and then maybe a few years later it was Los Angeles, New York. Then you had Los Angeles, New York, Atlanta, Chicago. 
Yeah. Now we can find someone anywhere. I mean, we, someone can, you could have a client, Brad, that lives in Omaha, Nebraska, like that lives anywhere and they could make a tape and the next thing you know, they're on television. Hello, I'm Ivan Wiener, Executive Director of the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience. Welcome to AFMX 2020, the virtual edition. As COVID-19 impacted so many festivals around the world, we are very fortunate and happy to be able to present an incredible program, thanks to our sponsors and our volunteers. Because of them, we're able to continue our tradition of bringing together filmmakers, musicians, students, and an entire community to share stories and collaborate into the future. This year, we have 73 incredible film projects with filmmakers doing live Q and A's after their screenings. We also have our intimate conversation series that we'll be offering for free through Facebook Live. Please go to our website, abqfilmx.com, get your tickets for all of the events, see where you need to go for the free ones, and share with all of your friends on social media. It's gonna be a week to remember. You can also make a small contribution through the ticketing pages for any of the events to the AFME Foundation. Finally, I'd like to thank our core team of staff members and volunteers who have worked so hard to bring the virtual experience to life. Kira, Ariella, Carly, Cindy, Shane, Sabrina, Barbara, Jerry, Sean, and Sam, this fest is for you. And it's for all of the volunteers who have contributed over the past eight years of AFMX. From all of us at the Albuquerque Film and Music Experience, thank you. Now, let's fest. Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to AFMX Intimate Conversations series. My name is Ben Andrews. I am the founder of the Seattle Film Summit, and I like to consider ourselves great collaborators with this wonderful festival that's happening online right now, AFMX. So uh, it's my honor to be interviewing the founder of Stage 32, Richard Botto, today. And uh, But before I dive right into that, there's a couple little logistics here I got to remind the audience of. Sounds like after or with 20 minutes, the remaining 20 minutes of this interview are going to be question and answer or Q&A. So just put any questions you have right there in the Facebook uh, messaging and uh, we'll relay those questions to RB when we get to that point. And uh, I think other than that, we're ready to start this thing off. So my introduction, I'm, I'm going to make, make this a little informal before I make it formal, RB, as you know me. Uh, I think that I met you for the first time, must have been the 2015 or 2016 uh, American film market. And I had a, a random meeting with you and your uh, development director, Amanda, and you didn't really know what you were stepping into. We had just launched we were about a year or two into the Seattle Film Summit. And, uh, and we were just looking for partners, basically. We were just kind of starting our outreach. But what it, the one thing that I took out of that meeting, and this applies to all of us in the creative industries, let's, let's just face it. Uh, socially navigating the creative industries is not always the easiest thing. Not everyone is out for your best interest. Not everyone is sane, not everyone is trustworthy, and anyone who's been in the game for a while uh, is a little guarded and has some walls up, right? <clears throat> I was immediately inspired by Richard R.B. For the rest of this, this uh, interview, we're going to call you R.B. I was immediately inspired by your warmth, your willingness to just help somebody who was new in the industry. Uh, and then I watched your panels 
you had a big panel there and I, and I, I watched you a little bit, some of your interviews and I was really impressed with your ability to just come from your own voice. And, and we'll talk a little bit later what that means. Um, but that one interaction made me go read your book. And this is where we'll transition into the formal introduction, which is uh, if you haven't read RB's book, Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers, and that's crowdsourcing, not crowdfunding. Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers, Indie Film, and the Power of the Crowd. Uh, this is a must read for you because talent in this industry uh, is very, very important, but just as important as your ability to make relationships, stay true to those relationships, bring value to those relationships, and be sane. Let's, let's call it for what it is. Uh, but anyway, Richard Botto, man, he's a triple, quadruple threat. Actor, writer, uh, producer, entrepreneur. Uh, you're the founder of Stage 32. Most of our audience knows what that is. Uh, you have films that have been in dozens of festivals. And I'm looking at, uh, you had a, a Sundance award-winning feature, Another Happy Day, and that was starring Ellen Barkin, Demi Moore, Kate Bosworth. Uh, and you have been across this gambit. So welcome, RB. I'm going to stop talking. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Of course. And thank you for having me. And uh, thanks to everybody, Ivan and everybody for, you know, Melody, uh, Carly, for being so cooperative with uh, getting this set up. And, and Ben, of course, we don't, I mean, we don't need to be formal. This is, this was billed as an intimate conversation. We, you and I talked about wearing silk pajamas. Unfortunately, I'm on the road and I didn't bring my silk pajamas, but I may or may not be wearing pants. I'm probably not. Uh, so that's kind of intimate. Uh, so we could start there. Uh, no, man, listen, I, listen, you and I have been friends now for a long time and I appreciate everything you said. And I know we're going to talk a lot about the creative journey and we're going to talk a lot about, um, you know, sort of what that means. Like you talked about being guarded and everything like that. Uh, these are all interesting topics and topics that we're dealing with. We always deal with when, when the industry is, you know, normal and now we're in this new normal and I think it's more important than ever. You brought up crowd, the crowdsourcing book, which I appreciate and always appreciate your support for the book, but you know, crowdsourcing has never been more important than right now. And that's something that we need to talk about as we're being socially distant and as we're doing all uh, this networking and all this communication and, and these types of interviews that normally would probably be in front of a live audience while we're doing them online. You know, all of these things matter more than ever. Your behaviors matter more than ever. How you uh, put a strategy into place for what you want as a creative uh, or as a professional in this business matters more than ever right now because it, it is a new normal and I don't think it's one that's going to be going away anytime soon. So we could dive into all of that as we move along. But first and foremost, it's great to be here and it's always great to be here with you. Awesome. Well, let's, let's uh, start in the shallow end of the pool. And by that, I mean, I'm being very sarcastic. <laughs> let's dive into, we've, this has been a year of change, not just quarantine, a lot of uh, social issues come to the forefront, uh, election year, all this good stuff. Um, as how are you doing, not creatively, but what has surprised you the most about yourself and how you have been handling all this change, especially as somebody in the creative industries? On the creative side or on the professional, on the creative side, you're asking, like you know, on the on the acting, writing, producing sort of side. Well, let's yeah, let's start there. Yeah. OK, because I, I think it's a good place. So I, I, I neglected to mention Kira. I didn't forget you. Thank you for being so awesome, as always. Um, yeah, the creative side has been interesting. You know, running a platform like Stage 32, and this is going to sound like I'm coming in from the professional side, but I'll get to where I'm going quickly. Um, you know, being in front of a platform that has nearly three quarters of a million people on it, we hear all day, or we've been hearing all day for the last, you know, eight, nine, ten months, how difficult it is to stay motivated and to stay creative. Um, and to have that motivation to create. And even for producers, you know, how to have that motivation when filming isn't happening, although we're starting to ramp up now, you know, to, to put projects together. And these are all valid concerns and valid questions. And certainly, you know, the one thing that does, does drive me nuts is that, you know, you have a lot of people on social media that says, no, you should be doing it, you should be doing it, you should be doing it, and making people feel worse. I would say that it's, being in front of a platform like that, yet being a creative myself, gives me a very, very unique position or a unique perspective on, on 
what people are going through because the whole reason I started stage 32 is because I'm creative and because I understood the importance of connections and the importance of access and everything like that. And I've utilized this platform for all it's worth. So I'm not only just the owner, but I am a, a, a super user of it. So coming in from that angle for me, creatively, it was a challenge at the beginning because Nobody, we were in the middle, for example, of, of putting a couple of films together that we were very, very close on. And then all of a sudden we had to pump the brakes. And that's a horrible feeling, especially when you spend a couple of years putting a project together and you feel like you're right at the finish line. And now you're like, well, we can't film. And is the money going to stay in? And will the talent stay in? And, you know, how long can we go before the talent is off to do something else or commits to something else? Will they still commit when we come back? You know, things like that. On the writing front, um, you know, I have been commissioned. One of the reasons I'm on this trip that I'm on right now, which, you know, I've been on the road for a few weeks is it's certainly business related, but it's also to take the time to finish a script that I was asked to write a hire to write, you know, about eight, nine months ago. And that I had a draft of that I didn't love and that I wanted to rework. And it took me a long time to get back into it, to get, because, you know, again, all these things, you know, you, it is tough to be motivated all the time. Now, in my defense, in between all this, and this is the positive side, because people say, you know, oh, nothing's happening right now, you know, why bother? I would say to you, that's the wrong way to be thinking right now. I'm not saying that you should be forcing yourself to do anything that you don't want to do, or anybody should be telling you that, you, you know, you're, you're a piece of shit if you're not motivated, which I've seen people do. Um, but the reality of the situation is development is happening at warp speed right now. Um, buying is happening again because you know there is going to be a need for content when this is all over so in my defense one of the things that's also prevented me from completing this feature uh is that i've been pitching a tv pilot uh we a tv pilot that i wrote we've attached the showrunner we attached the producer all this has happened during this time okay so we attached the showrunner we attached the producer uh we attached another producer who does a lot of packaging and bringing um, you know, shows around town. And that's what we've been doing for the last two months is we've been sending the deck around town and setting up meetings. And I've been pitching like crazy with my showrunner and it's been a wild experience and it's been a fun experience. And, uh, it just goes to show that stuff is happening everywhere. We've got meetings at every network that you could think of, every production company you could think of, and they're all buying. So that makes it easier to stay motivated and, you know, when you know things are happening. So what I would just say, you know, to everybody out there that's listening is, is you know, don't think for a second that business is stalled. It hasn't. In fact, it's ramping. Like I said, it's accelerating every single day. And that doesn't mean to put pressure on yourself if you're not motivated, but I hope that if you look at your goals and you look at what you really want to do with your career and, and where you want to be, like let's say a year from now, two years from now, that you recognize this time as sort of the fertile soil time. Like if you're not planning this stuff right now, um, you can't complain two years from now when everybody, when there's this gold rush of content, which we were already in before this happened, but it's going to be much richer when we come on the other side of this thing. Well, you're speaking to something that made me think about uh, discipline versus creativity. Mm -hmm. right? and, uh, I, I'm going to generalize here, but you know, creatives often go off on this lane where we're creatives. Like for me, it's like squirrel, butterflies, woo! And discipline and creatives are not always, you know, synonymous terms. Uh, and especially in this year where life is really taking our energy and distracting us because of the uncertainty. Um, uh -huh. You seem to be very disciplined in your approach to your work uh, as a creative. And I'm just curious, uh, what advice would you give to people about building that discipline within their own systems? First and foremost, I wouldn't follow my, my strategy of <laughs> discipline because I, I could, I call what I do control chaos. Uh, I am, all over the place. I, you know, but I'm also very goal oriented from the standpoint of, you know, things have to get done and, and I want to get them done. And, and I, I, I get very, I get bored very easily. Um, I don't like when things stand still. It's one of the reasons why I think I'm pretty good as a producer is because I'm constantly challenging the norms to say, okay, well, it's been a week. It's been 10 days. Can we move on this? Can we check in on that? Can we keep going here? How about, and by the way, if this doesn't work, can we do this, this, and the other thing? But then there is this part of me that 
is, you know, again, I'll go back to this feature script that I, that I was talking, I was speaking about earlier. You know, again, I was hired to do this and I think I was given a little bit more leeway. There's been, a, I think, a few reasons. One, because I know the people that hired me to do it. Two, they know it's a very complex subject. It's based on a true story and a life and the life rights that they have. And I, you know, I had to interview the subject multiple, multiple times. It's a, it's a long, it's an epic kind of story and everything like that. So there's a lot of moving parts and they know that. And like I said, I got through one sort of draft. I won't even call it a draft. I mean, it was like 128 pages and I still wasn't at the finish line. And I don't like that. Like, you know, like I, I don't write first drafts that are 180 pages. I just don't do it. But that's, again, some people can vomit. I'm not saying, again, don't follow my advice. I'm just saying that this is me. I like to finish that first draft and feel like the chiseling is not going to be months and months and months. So I had to take that draft and kind of push it off to the side and say, okay, why did I get to 128 pages and still like the finish line is definitely, you could see it, but it's still too far out. That took me a couple of months to kind of really break around that. Now, most people would say you need to be writing every day and you need to be, I don't believe that. I believe that when I was ready, that every day I was thinking about it and every day I was writing down some notes about it. And to me, that's writing. To me, that's creating. To me, that's, you know, molding. And when I finally sat down to start writing it again, it was almost, I mean, I wouldn't call it page one rewrite, but it was pretty close. And it took me a while you know, to get to a point. Now, this trip, I knew I had to take this trip. I took this trip for three reasons. It started with some business that I had to do up in Santa Barbara and the possibility of doing a little bit more business in another town up the coast, which I could or could not have molded into this thing. The second thing was I, I really wanted to get, you know, out a little bit. Like, you know, again, it can bore very easily. And I felt comfortable enough with COVID restrictions that um, I could do it. And, and feel safe doing it. And if I didn't feel safe, I could turn around and go. But the third thing was I wanted to finish the script. And that was the goal. The goal was this thing has to get done. And uh, so, you know, I've been in some very beautiful places where you're tempted to do anything but write and sit in front of a laptop and, you know, and everything like that. Um, if you know, you've traveled up the California coast, you certainly know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's, you know, there's a million beautiful places to see. And there are a lot of things open with, you know, and the protocols are fantastic. I like wine tasting. I'm in wine country. It's like, you know, there's a million things to distract you. But every day I said, this thing has to get done. And every morning I committed to diving into it. And I didn't put pressure on myself. I just said, when I'm done for the day, I'm done. I'll figure out when I'm done for the day. Like, you know, when i done. I'm done. And sometimes that was three pages. Sometimes it was 23 pages. It was crazy. I mean, you know, you're on these runs and, but yesterday I typed, you know, fade out and I'm thrilled with that. I'm done. Um, I'm done for now. Okay. Now I'm going to print the thing out and now I'm going to start chiseling that thing down. Okay. But the point of the matter is, is that I set that goal to do it in the months before it, I couldn't get into it. I couldn't find it. And that was okay. And I think that that that's the big lesson is discipline is there's a big, you know, you said discipline versus creativity. I'll, I'll throw in one more discipline versus creativity versus excuses. And the one thing that I can say is that when I look back on those two months where I wasn't working on the script, it wasn't excuses. It was that I needed to let that, that sit for a minute while I was pitching this TV series. And that TV series is a completely different world and, and needed my attention. And we had to memorize a 30 to 45 minute pitch, which by the way is not easy. And then put that pitch out there over and over and over again, sometimes two, three times a day, which, you know, again, it doesn't sound easy. I mean, sound may sound easy, but it's not, you know, and, and then answer questions and then do follow-up meetings and everything like that. So there was no laziness in there. It was just, this is what needed the attention right now. And this is what needed the discipline right now. Like the TV pitching needed the discipline right now. Not I, So I wasn't killing myself if we had two days where we weren't pitching the TV pilot. I wasn't killing myself that I wasn't writing the feature. I was just saying, keep your mind in this world. How can we make this better? What, what notes are we getting back that we can improve upon? How can we, you know, let's have some meetings on this. Who can we go after next? So, you know, again, it's, it's just being, at the end of the day, in a lot of ways, it's just being truthful with yourself. And I think that sometimes people have a hard time, especially creatives have a hard time being truthful with themselves because they allow too many outside voices to influence the way they feel. And that's certainly true of like, you know, the Twitter and Facebook crowd in this day and age. There's a lot of people spewing a lot of bullshit on those platforms and it drives me nuts. And a lot of people listening to the 
the wrong voices. And um, hopefully, if you're if you're watching this, that you know you'll think about that, and you'll curate your feeds, and you'll curate your life to surrounding yourself with people that actually can give you valid advice and or valid information, but also give you that positive nature and that positive nurturing that we need at a time like this. It's a voice. It's a perfect segue, uh, which is back to my intro, which was one of the things that very much impressed me about you when I first met you is that when I was talking with you, you were coming from your own voice. In other words, I knew right off the bat, I wasn't getting any kind of LA bullshit talk or, you know, like nobody was playing the game with me. Like this was, this was somebody who was sincere. Um, and, and you hit the nail on the head, not only in this age with social media, but compound that with the creative industries where we're always looking to create what somebody wants to consume instead of creating what we know is our own voice. I, I'm curious, how did you develop that within yourself? Was that just life experience? And what could you do? What would you recommend to your audience members to be doing their art with their voice? I mean, honestly, all credit to my grandparents in a lot of ways. My grandparents were the most authentic people that I ever met in my life and, and were, you, they never, I never saw a fake moment with them. They were just completely authentic. You know, my, my, father's parents were blue collar. My mother's parents were white collar. And, you know, my father's parents were first generation uh, Italian. My, my, uh, my mother's was second, but they had within them, they had just this, this honesty that uh, was undeniable. And that didn't mean that they were, you know, gullible. And I mean, they helped so many people. They did so many things for so many people, but they were never gullible and they were never taken advantage of. They just, you know, they knew when to, pull back if they had to when they were being taken advantage of but they but they came from a place of always wanting to help other people especially people that they identified as wanting to help themselves and I think that's a huge part of our industry one of the things you know you said in the opening was that if you've been in this business for a while you're on guard and you're right I think but you're on guard I think for because you get approached all the time by people who want you to help them but they haven't done anything to help themselves you know, when you get asked questions, for example, that anybody could get the answer to by Googling, then my reaction is you're lazy. Okay. My reaction is you're not serious. All right. Fair or unfair, that's what I'm going to feel. Right. I always say that in this business, uh, if somebody has been in this business for more than five minutes, they could tell the person who hasn't been in the business for more than five minutes because that person will ask all the, you know, the same questions and, and, you know, ex, you know, tell you they have the greatest script that's ever been written or, you know, I've, you know, got to see my movie. It's the most amazing thing that's ever, you know, and you, know, you hear that and you go, okay, you have a lot to learn, but we all came from there. The difference between the people that make it and the people that don't make it is the people that make it, figure it out. Like they figure out the idea that, um, they need to help themselves first. They need to come from a place of information. You know, when I was first starting out producing, a very famous producer said to me, here's the way that you get ahead as a producer that hasn't produced anything, which I hadn't at the time. Bring knowledge, bring value. And question the thing, if you're gonna question something, make sure you're questioning it uh, with information behind it. Like, you know what I mean? With knowledge behind it. And I think that that's so valid uh, with everybody, you know, with anybody that's listening again, that, you know, is looking to approach somebody that has more experience than you have, you have to, you know, bring value to that person, bring value to the conversation. Now for me, you know, you ask, how do you stay authentic and how do you have that authentic voice? It's definitely my upbringing. It's definitely, I'm not an LA guy. I'm a New York guy. So, you know, I always say the difference between New York people and LA people is New York people, you know, come to your face, show you the knife, tell you it's nothing personal and then stab you in the stomach. LA people come from behind you, hide the knife, whisper in your ear how wonderful you are and then stab you in the back. That is part of our business, but you have to learn how to navigate that. I know that that's kind of cute, but it's kind of true. Like you really do have to know how to navigate the business. Now, people in LA won't come behind you if you're bringing value, because if you're bringing value, they want to come to your face and they want to come and they want to talk to you and they want to know more about you and they want to know what you can do for them. And then they in turn are going to tell you what they can do for you. So I just think, you know, when I met you, 
the value you brought me was the fact that you told me about this ambition that you had and what you wanted to do in the Pacific Northwest and where you thought you could bring value to that region and where you felt that region was untapped. And to me, my immediate reaction was, this guy knows his shit. This guy's done his homework. This guy is, you know, he's, he's prepared to go into battle. And, you know, my natural reaction then is, what can I do? You know, how can I help? And that's the difference, I think, you know, that's the difference. But I think the authentic voice, I think, comes from being fair, being real about where, I keep, keep on back to being real, but being real about where you are uh, at that place in time with your career, with your profession, and with what you want, you know, what ultimately is your goal. So it's okay to be inexperienced, but it's not okay to be inexperienced and say, you have to read my stuff. You have to read my stuff. It's, it's more, can you give me some advice? Can you give me, you know, but again, it can't be advice that you, again, you could Google in two seconds. You know, I tell this story every once in a while. You've heard me tell it. I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to tell the whole story. It's actually in the book, but it's a really, really, I'll tell the very, very short version of it. But I was at the Austin film festival one time and a famous producer, director, Oscar winning writer, producer, director, um, you know, spent 40 minutes. Uh, he was the opening talk and he spent 40 minutes talking about, uh, the business and about how to navigate it and just gave out pieces of gold and pieces of gold and pieces of gold. And then when he opened up for questioning, the first question he got was how do I protect my screenplay? And this guy eviscerated <laughs> the person who asked that question. And I sat there and went, you know, a year later I was sitting with him and I told him the story about what he did. And he goes, was that too harsh? And I go, he goes, I feel like it was proper. And I'm like, it was proper, you know, because he basically said, you know, you spent a gajillion dollars to come down here to hear me talk and to be at this festival and to ask me a question that you could have had answered by a Google search. And, you know, you have me, this wealth of knowledge, this award winning, come ask me something, you know, you got on a plane, you thought about that, you went to bed last night, you woke up this morning, you thought about it, and that's the question you asked me? You know what I mean? So again, it's it's knowing, oh, I lost an ear, knowing your place, knowing, you know, where you're at, and um, uh, just being able to be authentic in that way on both ends. You know, whether you're the person asking the question or whether you're per the person being asked the question. I'm gonna pick up my other ear. Just a reminder to the audience, uh, we are going to be taking questions for the last 20 minutes of this intimate conversation. So uh, we're getting a, a wealth of information right now. So uh, don't forget your questions, put them in chat, and those questions will be filtered to us. To get your By the way, back. if I'm not, I got my ear back. By the way, if I'm not answering, you know, if you want me to elaborate on anything, let me know. Because I know these are, it seems like these are very broad questions. These are things that we get asked all the time and everything like that, but they're really not. I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, I always, you know, to, to this day, like, okay, so let me, let me take this from a slightly different angle really, really quickly. I don't want people in the audience to think like, okay, well, this is the guy that's got it all figured out. So I'm going to always come to somebody like me. I don't have it all figured out. I ask questions all the time, okay? But I never enter a conversation uninformed, okay? If I don't have the answer to something or if I don't understand it, like, you know, perfect example, again, a, another film we're putting together, it's being structured in a way that's very different than a lot of other films we put together. This producer has done this a few times. We had a conference call. I listened to him go on and on. When it was, I did a little Googling when we got done just to kind of, you know, and then I called him and I said, listen, I said, I just need to know for future conversations. I said, I didn't understand this one point of it. And, and then I said, let me try. Is it because, you know, if we lay out X dollars and so-and-so is going to get Y dollars and this, and he'd be like, and then, you know, he was like, kind of, not exactly. And he explained the whole thing, but he appreciated the fact that at least I came in, you know, from a genuine place and from a real place. And nobody will ever, ever, uh, unless they're a complete asshole, which you run into one or, few in, one or two in this business, will ever uh, go after you or eviscerate you for, or challenge you if you come in from a place of curiosity that uh, is, you know, backed with, uh, you know, an attempt to understand or with honesty, with an honest intent. Let's put it that way. 
so much good stuff. I don't even know where to go through. From here. But uh, I'm always fascinated with this lane and it is a broad topic and, and it's a different answer for everybody. Uh, and I'm just processing out loud here, but it, it's this voice thing, right? It, it's kind of what you're speaking about. People want help, um, but they don't want to work for themselves sometimes. Yep. And, and so they'll come to you where, where you so succinctly said, just Google it. If you come to me with a question from Google that you could have done, well, then you're kind of wasting my time. Um, but I'm also, I'm also this proponent of people aren't one way or the other. They just have to learn to become one way or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. And you had parents, grandparents that were authentic, helped a lot of people. Uh, and so a lot of that was ingrained in you and you built upon it. But there's a whole subset of population that w we don't have that, right? <laughs> so sure. I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, what advice would you give to people? And you already have started on this, like, learn to help, but to identify those that really need help. That's a big one that I wanted to talk about more. But how do I go down this path of sh shifting my own self help? I, I think it's actually really easier, easier than you think. I think that very, very clearly, and, and if, I, if you could leave a one piece of advice today, this is the piece of advice. You are an entrepreneur, okay? Whether you're an actor, a writer, a filmmaker, a producer, it doesn't matter. You are an entrepreneur. You are the CEO of You Inc. It's just the reality of it, right? So I'm a business guy. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also a creative, all right? I can tell you that one informs the other tremendously because I look at my screenwriting career and I look at my acting career and everything like that. I look at it as a business and it is a business because to everybody else, it's a business. I'm a commodity. Okay. If you write a screenplay, it's a commodity. If you're an actor, you're a commodity. Okay. To that film, to that play, uh, to that director, it doesn't matter. So ultimately at the end of the day, how do you build you ink? All right. So if I said to you, Today, you're going to start a business, and that business is going to be you're selling widgets, okay? You want to be the biggest widget seller in the history of all mankind, all right? But there are a lot of other widget sellers out there. What would you do? You would do your research. You would do your market research. You would do your, uh, you know, your cost analysis versus your competitors. You would do, all, you know, you do a million different things. The point of the matter is that you would do a ton of due diligence. You wouldn't, okay? go to somebody that used to be in the widget community and go, I have the greatest widget ever and you need to look at it. Or, you know, go to another company and say, we should do things together. Uh, you know, you a big widget maker, like I have a better widget. We should do things together because they would go, why would I do business with you? You have no customers. You have no nothing. You have no proof. You have no, but this is what people do in creative work all the time. They tell you, like I said, they have the greatest screenplay, the greatest filmmaker and I'll, and my response is you and everybody else, okay? Because the great screenwriters and great filmmakers, they've proven themselves on a lot of different levels. They, you know, some of them have helped package films, which is a big thing in this day and age, have brought more value to the table, you know, but to do that, you have to understand the business. This TV pilot that I am pitching, for example, I wrote it. Now, uh, some writers will just say to me, well, so what'd you do? You just sent it around and you just, I'm like, no. I went out and attached the showrunner uh, to make it more valuable. I went out and attached the producer to make it more valuable. And then we took that package to all these people because all these people, all these networks, all these production companies, if you have the script, they go, eh, that's nice. But you know, we really don't want to do the heavy lifting. But if you have the script end and the script end, but this is years of understanding. So what I did was say, you ink for screenwriting. You really want to get this done? Okay, build it make it into a more attractive package, make it more, you know, so that mind shift comes from looking at yourself as an entrepreneur. And now all of a sudden, if you look at yourself as an entrepreneur, if you're, again, let's just use a screenwriter or a filmmaker, you look at all the other screenwriters and the filmmakers out there as competition to you, which is not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. What you're looking at is how do I get what everybody else is trying to get? And how do I work and navigate to make sure that I get there. And then all of a sudden what you start realizing is the same thing that you realize as an entrepreneur. You need contacts, you need relationships, okay? You need allies, you need champions. 
And that's where it all starts coming from. And, you know, if, if you can do those things, all of a sudden, everything becomes a little bit easier. How did I get this showrunner? Somebody that I'd known for years, never asked him to do a damn thing for me. He didn't even know. I was the only TV thing I've ever written. Asked him to read it. Actually asked him to read it just for his advice. He came back and said, I need to be a part of this. I love it. The guy's been in the business for 25 years. He's been, you know, he's been in TV for 25 years and to get that kind of validation is great, but I couldn't have gotten him. I couldn't have approached him at a, at a conference and said, Hey, you know, great for you. That, you know, you did a really nice job speaking today. Hey, would you read my script? He'd be like, fuck are you? You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, yeah, exactly what he would say. But like, who the fuck? But because I built a relationship with him over five years, when I finally said to him, Hey, you know, it'd be great if you would take a look at this. He was like, yeah, sure. And it still took him a couple of months. You know, I mean, I wasn't like expecting him to come back tomorrow. They're, everybody's busy, you know, and you got to realize that. That's the other thing. That's one other thing, aspect I want to add to this is that you have to realize that every single person you ask for five minutes of time gets asked that a hundred times a day. Every single person, and by the way, there's no such thing as five minutes. It's never five minutes. And the second thing is, is that, you know, people are going to give their time to people they know. The people that you're asking for five minutes of their time are also getting hit up by people they do know and that they do have a relationship with and who they do want to help genuinely for that same five minutes, sometimes for the two hours it takes to read the script or to watch a film. So you need to be aware of all this. And that's, so that's how your mind shifts. Your mind shifts from, it's not, a, it's, it's you, your mind shifts from sprinting to marathon running. And if you can shift to that, to that idea that you can't run mile 26 before you run mile 10, okay? If you shift your mind to that and you can't get to mile 10 before you run mile one, all of a sudden what ends up happening is you get calmer and that sense of panic goes away. And when you do talk to people, they're not looking at you like you're desperate, which you never want. Okay. You always want to maintain a veneer of control and you really should have that veneer of control because if you were really an entrepreneur and you really were starting that widget company and you really did have the know-how on how to run a business, you would never expect to open your doors on day one and be the biggest, biggest widget seller in the world. You would know you have a long road ahead of you, but you're prepared and you're ready to go and here's the value and this is why customers are going to like it and now you're off to the races, right? Same thing with a creative career. And that's how you shift your mentality. Beautiful. And I just want to hit your point home uh, and a, a challenge to you in the audience as a creative. Uh, to Barbie's point of a commodity and the widgets example, which I've heard a lot of widgets. You talk about a lot of widgets, but if you're creative, and you don't know how to write a business plan, because business plans are for businesses. Like, mm -hmm. Sometimes we went out of that world because we don't want to learn that stuff. If you don't know how to write a business plan, Google it, figure it out. And then in that business plan, put yourself, whether you are a writer, actor, director as the business and check out the, the paradigm shift you will have when you approach your own creativity. That's a tremendous exercise, by the way. I, I've never heard that before. And I think it's brilliant. And, and again, these are the types of exercises that people who are serious about a career in this business will do. And the people that aren't will go onto Twitter and go onto the hashtag film Twitter and yell at each other about how nothing's happening in the business and everything sucks and everything like that. That's just the reality. You know, it's, it's, you have to look at yourself at the end of the day, you only have to answer to yourself. So an exercise like this will make you kind of sit there. You know, I would even recommend do it put it away for two days, come back in two days and read it again, like clear your mind of it and come back and read it with fresh eyes, maybe even a week and, and look at it. And are you horrified at, you know, the way that you laid it out? Or are you sitting there going like, Hey man, it's, you know, it's pretty comprehensive. That's pretty good. And you know, if, until you feel good about it, once you feel, you know, do it again, if you don't feel good about it and, you know, correct course, correct. And I think that's what a lot of people in this business and listen, it's not easy. I, one other thing I want to just talk about, I mean, look, there's a lot of negativity in this business, you know, as far as, you know, you hear no a lot. We're hearing no with the TV pitch. And I got to tell you, as long as, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years on the writing side or eight, nine years on the writing side. And I've sold a lot of things and things have not gotten made. And, and we almost thought they were going to get made. And, they did, and, you know, and it never gets easy. I mean, even now, you know, when you have this tremendous pitch and again, my asset, my ally, my 
brother on this thing is a 25 year vet who's so well known in TV. I'm nobody in TV. I've done nothing but features. This is the first TV thing. Okay. The, certainly the success of the feature and the selling of things has helped me. And the fact that I created it has helped me. And the fact that this guy is backing the fact that I created it and loves it so much helps me. But this is the guy like, you know, he's sitting there and he's, and the two of us are in there pitching our asses off and, you know, and getting follow-up meetings and everything like that. And then you wait a week and then all of a sudden you get that no. And you're like, you know, that entire week, you're like, we killed it. So, and then you got to rise up and do it again. And it's not easy. So like, I just want everybody to understand, like, look, this is, you need a thick skin for this business. But the thing that makes it easier for us, like every time we get that no, or we've gotten a no, we've said, but we have this place to go and we have this place to go and we have this place to go and we have those places to go because we have those connections because we built those connections over time. So again, it's building a career, right? It's building a business. It's building your entrepreneurial ship for lack of a better way of putting it to, you know, in a, in a manner where you feel like you're still part of the game and the reject and you understand that the rejections are part of the game. They're not, you know, so, uh, just part of it. You know, if, if, a, if a network only has 15 slots and 13 of them being renewed from the year before, well, you're two of, you know, maybe 500 that are pitching, you know, or you're one of 500 that are pitching for two slots. You know what I mean? You got to And you got to realize that. So, Anyway, the way there are ways to make navigating this business easier and this idea of entrepreneurship and this idea of doing a business plan and everything like that, those are tools and methods and ways that will allow you to free your mind from all the negativity that's out there and allow yourself to kind of be patient and to kind of relax. Like people always say, well, give, me, give me one word. That you, if you, you give one word of advice, what that word be? And I always say, relax, relax. Not everything is so urgent. Not everything is so drama filled. You know, if you get a no or if you get bad notes or if you get notes that just kill your script, it's one person's opinion. You know, you take them, you absorb them, you, you, you know, you put into place what you want to put into place. So you don't, but you know, it's, it's up to you. You are the CEO of you. So you make that decision. It's really that simple. Yeah. Well, I think it's important for everybody to really embrace that, uh, marathon versus sprint analogy you know this truly is, you have to and and that's one thing that i really appreciated about about your book is that and just what you just said as far as when you realize that this is the decade plan when you realize that this is the marathon the no's and the rejections become a little less painful and you take a little bit more breath and there's a little less desperation because you know that your work can just improve over time. Uh, and so let's well, it's uh, what you really quickly, it's what you learn from the no, right? I mean, every, I always say that there's a lesson inside every no. Now, look, we've gotten a few no's from the, you know, the pitching of the TV pilot, but with every no, we've gotten feedback and that feedback sometimes could be network specific. It could be like, you know what? We just, it's a period thing. We just don't know where, and if we get that, we go, you know, well, nothing we can do about it. It's a period piece. Nothing we can do about it. Right. Um, but if we get back, you know, I just wish, you know, there was a little bit more of a spotlight on the female characters. Well, like, well, we could work with that because we've talked this thing through a million times and the female characters are gigantic in this show. So maybe we're not pitching it right. So then we look at the pitch and we say, is there too much of an emphasis on this? And, you know, like, because we're like, oh my God, the female characters are like front and center in this thing. So if we didn't, if we didn't get that, or if they didn't get that, then we're doing something wrong. So you learn, it doesn't make the sting of the no any less, but at least you sit there and say, let me take the knowledge, let me take the feedback, let me take the information and let me apply it. And I think that that's also what a lot of creatives lose is they get so devastated by the feedback and so crushed by it. And listen, I, I did too. When I first started out, man, I, you know, I, I've said this a million times, people have probably have watched me before and they're gonna see this and they're gonna be like, I've heard this so many times, but I'm just gonna do it for people that haven't. You know, I used to go, good piece of news, a good piece of coverage, I used to go here, bad piece of coverage, go here. You know, now it's just like, boom, boom, really good news? Oh yeah. I'm celebrating, you know, I'm opening a really good bottle of wine, you know, I'm cracking open a really rare bottle of bourbon, really bad news. All right. You know, that sucks, but I gotta like, how do you get, you know, it's, how do you get off the mat? 
you know, how do you get off the mat? Like, what, what did I learn from that really negative situation or that really negative thing? Like, what have I learned? And I think once you get into that mindset, you will relax and you won't punish yourself and you won't be so hard on yourself. And I think a reason a lot of people quit in this business is because they are so hard on themselves and because they can't take, you know, they, they, they take the criticism um, so, so deeply that, you know, uh, they feel like they're a failure. And that's not the case. I mean, what do we, what did they say a few years ago? 50,000 scripts at the WGA and, you know, how many studio films? I mean, you know, how many, how many things were made? I mean, it's just, you, you got to look at it that way. But that only, sound, that only sounds like a negative. What I would say to you is out of that 50,000, what I've talked to, you know, for people even at contests, they'll say, you know, out of that 50,000, there's probably only like 50 or 100 that really are that top of the top. You know what I mean? So that's what you're striving for, to be that top of the top. Never mind the rest of it. You know what I mean? And if you get yourself in that mindset, I think it becomes much more, it's like I said, if you were starting a widget company, would you want to be the best? Well, if you're going to be a writer or a producer or an actor or a filmmaker or whatever, then you want to be the best. So take that knowledge and become the best. Well, I also love that everything you're speaking about, uh, you know, whether it's patience in your career, whether it's the authenticity of your voice, all these little traits, they also manifest in how you take the quality of the input you're receiving, whether it resonates properly to your script or whether... Uh, it it doesn't. So I'm curious, in, early in your career, do you have an experience where somebody gave you feedback and maybe it sent, just sent you off in the wrong direction? And at some point you were like, God damn it, why did I listen to that? Um, not really, and only because I think the advantage that I had as a writer was that I started as a producer. So I read a lot of scripts. And... Um, so I kind of knew, like, even when we were giving notes or I was giving notes, storytelling and everything like that. I will say that there have been times where people have made suggestions that have been mind-blowingly, like, how the hell didn't I see that? What a brilliant idea that I've actually applied. That's definitely happened. But I'll tell you, I'll raise the ante on you, is I have taken career advice that I wish I hadn't taken that had set me back. And, you know, part of that is, you know, people ask me all the time about, you know, representation and, oh, if I only had a rep. And I hear this in acting, I hear this in writing. If I only had a rep, forget it. Like I could just, you know, my career would be, well, I had one of the best in the business. And, you know, we made a deal, sold a script, and, you know, I won't get into all of it, but there were a lot of things that I definitely feel were handled. I don't feel it. I mean, I. I know it and my and having come from a producer's background but not being a producer on the project because I was the writer it was killing me because I was sitting there going like we should do this we should do that and then finally they actually did bring me as a producer because they heard this is the value thing they heard me bringing value and saying well why don't we try this why don't we try that so they brought me in as a producer but by that point we were like two years down two years down the road with this thing and the reality of the situation was I put my trust into certain people because of their reputations and because of who they were and and their experience but the reality of the situation is their attention was very divided with other projects and and this project ended up getting a little bit and and instead of me challenging it a little bit more, I accepted it because everybody said to me, like, oh my God, like, you know, you're, you're dealing with Hollywood royalty here. Like you, you know, and that was a huge lesson for me. The reality of the situation is you should challenge everybody and you should challenge, I don't care if you're a writer and, you know, Scorsese is directing your script. If you don't like the way something's going, as long as, what, this ties back into what we said earlier, as long as you're coming from an, an informed place and that your argument makes sense, when I went to my manager and this producer and this production company who paid me for the script and said, this is bullshit, you're handling it wrong, and this is why, and this is what I believe, I came armed. I had industry information, I had who was buying what, who, who was selling in the foreign market. I came with so much information that they were like, holy shit. And they were like, we need to bring you in. And we hear you, and you're right, and we need to bring you in. But that took two years. And 
that's a, it's not what I say it's a regret because it was a learning experience. I don't like that word regret because I feel like, you know, punishing yourself over it is nothing. It was a learning experience. And, you know, once I learned it, never made that mistake again. There were situations where I was in meetings with people that I was certainly the least experienced person in the room. And I'm talking, if I named the names on, on here, everybody would be like, really? You were in rooms with these people. And I was, and I would sit there and listen. And at, w- at one point I said, I just don't agree with any of this. And here's why. And I saw the person that brought me into the meeting, their face, they went, the blood came out and I thought they were going to die in the room. And they, but everybody in the room was like, that's you know, really interesting, which in Hollywood, by the way, really, that's really interesting. It could mean like this fucking guy never want to see him again or, or this fucking guy, we need to bring him in. You never know. Fortunately, it was the latter. They wanted to bring me in. But when I left the room, you know, the person that brought me in said, you know, the, the fucking balls on you to do that. But my response was, and it's not the balls on me to do it. It was, it's, I believed in it. And I, and I knew the spot. I knew to pick the battle right there. Because if I didn't pick the battle right there, we probably went, would have went the other direction. It would have been six, eight months down the road and it probably wouldn't have worked. You know what I mean? So the, the, again, all of this ties into, you know, that sense of knowledge. Now, just because I just want to answer your question, because just because I didn't have an experience where I picked the wrong thing and went down that road doesn't mean it doesn't happen all the time. So I would implore you if you are a writer, um, because this is the example we're using, but also if you're creative in any way, the, you got to know who you're getting feedback from. Like, you know, if you're going to pay for feedback, make sure there's pure transparency, you know, like stage 32 and I'm not pimping out our services, but I just want to make this point. It's for the reason that the only way I would do these services, this was, this was my mandate as the CEO of the company was that you as the writer get to pick the executive that we have a roster of executives. You get to pick the executive based on genre, budget, all that. So if you're a horror writer, like we literally have one of the creative uh, cons- uh, uh, development executives from Blumhouse that you can have read your script. So there's full transparency. You're not getting read by Joe one, two, three, who may be less experienced than you are, which happens all the time in this business. And that's the thing that drives me nuts. I never get notes from people I don't know. And to this day, by the way, I get notes from on my own services. And if it's an executive that I know, I just change my name on the title. So I get no preferential treatment. But I use my services because I know exactly the executive that's reading the script. So I use it all the time. Like, you know what I mean? Because I want the notes. I want the notes from somebody that's in the trenches right now. I don't want favoritism. I don't want anybody reading it and going like, you know, blowing smoke in my ass. So I'll take my name off it. Or like I said, just change my name. But it's so vital that you know who you're getting notes from. And this is, again, the thing that I see on social media. I see people trading scripts with people they don't know. And you don't know if they're as good as you are or if they have the, the level of experience that you have or, you know, if they don't read it or they gloss it and just give you and people take that as gospel and it kills me. Bad notes, bad management uh, or bad, bad representation, bad, you know, bad getting notes from people that are inexperienced, um, having bad representation. All of those things could set you back years, literally years. And so you have to know. But again, if you were running a business, if you were running your a widget company, would you take your widget or show your factory or whatever to somebody that has no experience in it? Of course you would. So why give your script to somebody that you don't know? Why give your script to somebody that you know you've never met before? You don't know their skill level, or there's not full transparency on. I mean, I I, I don't understand it. I'm sure glad we're recording this because there's so much that needs to be watched again and reabsorbed. <laughs> uh, we've got about 12 minutes before we dive into the Q and A, um, so I'm just going to transition a little bit to future mapping. You uh, you started early talking about how nothing's going on, but the development system is just bustling. So let's future map a few months. Uh, even into the new normal. And I'd love to get some of your predictions of what we're going to see in 2021, 22. Well, I mean, look, I think that, you know, obviously everything is based on what happens this fall. 
I mean, I could tell you my, the, the showrunner that I talked about that, uh, you know, is attached to the TV pilot. He is working currently on a, on a very, very big show that was filming their season finale when everything hit. And they just went back to the Sony lot about three weeks ago to film the last, basically, it was a two part finale, basically the last, you know, show and a half or episode and a half. And they're going to go right into writing the next season. I mean, but they're going to do it virtually. And their hope is that they could be back on, you know, set filming that in, in, in the spring, you know, so, but there is also these concerns and these contingencies in place that if, you know, it ramps up again in California, and we're really in a bad place come the spring and there's no vaccine or we're not in a place where the vaccines are, are you know, doing what, you know, they're not covering the ground that everybody thinks that they're going to need to cover and everything like that, then, you know, they're already talking about contingency plans of where else they can film. So I think what we're going to see, and we're already seeing it, to be honest with you, is a lot of these shows are looking to, and a lot of these films, especially the films, because shows are a little different because obviously you have sets built and you have things, you know, it just depends on the type of show. But a lot of films are moving around to where they can shoot. It used to be like, where's the best incentives? It's now like, where the hell can we shoot? And we're seeing a lot of that. You know, we're talking to a lot of people in the business that, that where that's a very, very big part of what's going on. Like, for example, I know one very big production company that had a film that was set up, I believe it was in Georgia. It was someplace where the incentives are great right now. And they're not thrilled with the protocols and everything they're going to have to hop through. So they're kind of issuing the the incentive to go get a lesser incentive in a place where they know they're not going to be bothered. They know they can get it done and the protocols aren't quite as severe. Um, my feeling is everybody is starting to buy again. Um, people that, especially on the TV side, uh, you know, obviously we're going to be deluged with, you know, reality TV because it's easier to film and look, you know, one location, couple locations, and, and obviously everybody's buying that right now, snatching it up, docu-series, that kind of thing. We see a ton of that as far as on the consumer side, but I think on the development and filming side, I think what we're going to see is this explosion of, uh, content that it's going to be a massive amount because there were a lot of shows and a lot of, you know, that were being canceled when this was happening, the way there were slots open. And now you also have all these new platforms that have kind of come online, like Peacock and HBO Max and everything like that, while this is going on. And they're going to need content. Like I even hear people like, you know, because Quibi now is going to maybe go up for sale and they're like, oh, Quibi's done. No, no, no. Even if it sells, they're going to need content. Like, it's so ridiculous the way people think. They're like, oh, this, you know, you know, Quibi's finished. Like, you shouldn't even think short form. No, no, no. You should be thinking short form. Like, I mean, so I just think that it's, I couldn't give you the timing. Like, when you sit there and you say, you know, the next three to six to 12 months, I couldn't give you the timing because nobody knows what's going to happen this fall. I mean, everybody's preparing for this second wave. And I think we're going to have chaos where everybody who has the flu is going to think they have COVID. And, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be chaos for a little bit, but I think that this business is proven and any business where you have so much money on the line that where there's a will, there's a way and they're going to find a way and there are going to be pockets of places where you could film. And I think in 12 months, God willing, I think you're going to, it's going to be as a consumer, I think you're going to have more con maybe 12 to 18 months. You're going to have more content than you're going to know what the hell to do with, because I think there's going to be so much being produced. And, and so, so again, you know, if you're writing or you're producing, you need to be pushing. I mean, you really do right now. You need to be pushing. And, and I, again, that's not to put pressure on you, but it's just to say that, you know, if, if you could rise up right now and dig in and, and shut out the noise and think 12 to 18 months out, which you always should be anyway, you know, the, the idea is always to be looking that far out. Um, you're really in a good position right now. Or you yeah. will be in a good position right now. Well, to, to your point, I know in, in a couple of our circles, we like to, to say that right now, obviously our front line is our is the medical industry, our doctors and our nurses, they're the front line right now. Uh, and when we come out of this, there will be a new front line. And I like to believe it is, it's, it's not just creatives in the film industry, it's creatives across all industries who will become the front line, especially to a nation that will need its morale raised significantly. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, I think, you know, I've been encouraged, I have to say. I mean, again, going back to the showrunner that's working on the show I talked about earlier, like I asked him, I said, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's in his 60s, you know, and I said, you know, any fears going on set? And, he, and he's like, the, the protocol, the, what they have in place is just, you can't help but feel safe. You know, I've been on this on the road for three weeks and it's, you know, I've had so many people that in the industry or in the business that, you know, have asked me, you know, have you, how have you felt, you know, being out and about being in hotels and everything like that. And I have to say, there hasn't been one moment where I haven't been completely impressed by how businesses and hotels and everything have handled themselves. I mean, you're going to make sacrifices, you know, they're not making up your room. They're not, but who cares, right? It's, it's, people are adjusting and I think they're adjusting in the right way. And that's not to minimize what's going on, but I do think that industry is happening. And, you know, again, we don't know what's going to happen in the fall and we don't know if there's going to be this so-called second wave and everything like that. And maybe it will shut things down for a while, but there will be an end. And when it does end, I agree with you. Entertainment is going to lead the charge, I think. And what entertainment is going to look like as far as theaters are concerned or, you know, is an Apple or a Netflix or an Amazon going to come, come in and buy a theater chain? I've been chanting this for seven years and I still think it's going to happen at some point. I mean, they bought a couple, um, you know, I think it's going to happen at some point and maybe, ent- and then maybe a night going to the movies is not just the movie, but full entertainment value. Maybe it's a fuller experience. Maybe, you know, the things that used to be DVD extras or whatever, I mean, whatever it might be, there might be a fuller experience or a more immersive experience, whatever it is, but it will happen. And there will be an evolution. And I think that that is the optimism that I think everybody needs to hold on to right now because everything is so pessimistic. You know, you read the news, you listen to that. Like I said, you go on social media and it's just so pessimistic. And I choose not to be, uh, you know, I choose to be optimistic about it. And it may not be three months. I listen, I'd love to be in the theaters this fall watching all the Oscar you know, qualifying, that's my, that's my jam, you know, watching all the Oscar qualifying kind of films. I don't, you know, I'm not missing the Transformers movies, but you know, you get, you get my point. Like I love going to the theater in the fall and seeing some of these great films. I love seeing them on the big screen. I don't need to be in a theater right now just because I'm traveling up the road. doesn't mean I'm going to sit in the theater with a mask for two hours. I don't need to be, but I'm, and I miss it, but I think there will be that it will rise again. I just think that, you know, with great controversy, and uh, great challenges and great adversity comes uh, evolution and creativity. And I think we're seeing it already. And uh, I think it's just going to keep expanding and expanding and expanding to the point where when we are all free from this, there is just going to be this, first of all, it's going to be this overwhelming sort of joy to be out and about in some sort of normal way again. But then there's also going to be this incredible wealth of creativity and com- content to be consumed that's just going to be overwhelming and i i'm looking forward to that and i think it will happen so the audience is going to have to forgive me for this one but two sundays ago at the very end of the evening how were you feeling at the end of the nfl season game one Oh Jesus! Well, I'm a Jet fan, so I felt miserable. I think the Jet game, Jet game, kicked off at 10:05. By 10:06, I was ready to run into traffic. So, uh, you know, I mean, look, it's funny that you asked me that question because I, you know, I'm a huge sports fan, but no, I'm a big Met fan, big Jet, fan, obviously New Yorker, you know. And I got to tell you, it's it's been weird, you know. It's been I haven't been as absorbed by it as I thought I would be. The NFL, I a little more, you know, baseball for sure, until the Mets started collapsing a little bit and everything. I didn't mind nobody in the stands. It, it felt great to have it. You know, it felt great to know that it's there. I think the thing that I feel really, really good about is the fact that where I, I think, that, and this is the weird thing, like it's, it's the encouragement of it all is the fact that we're two weeks into an NFL season or through two weeks of an NFL season had a few weeks of a college football season and there hasn't been any major outbreaks. I mean, I know college had one, you know, with the Notre Dame situation this weekend and everything like that, but we haven't had these major outbreaks, you know, major league baseball had a few bumps, but really the last three or four weeks have been clean. Hockey managed to get through it all, which was amazing to me. The NBA has managed to. So there's, there's an encouragement within there that inspires me. Um, 
it feels good that it's there. It feels good, and it feels good to watch. And I certainly have. I mean, I got you know, I, I we felt. I'll give you a great answer to this. Felt fantastic to be. I was in Carmel on Sunday night, and it felt amazing to be sitting outdoors, socially distant from people, which felt weird. And you know, and you know, go inside, you put your mask on, everything. Fine. Again, fine. Okay, but to be sitting there, you know, with you know a, a cocktail and watching like Seattle and New England on the TV, on one TV. And I think it was the Lakers on the other and just no, and then all of us just feeling like that was normal. And I think we all need that right now. I just think we all need that right now. So whatever it takes for you to feel that I highly encourage you to do it, um, safely. And, uh, but don't be, don't be afraid to venture out into open air a little bit. If, if everybody's handling this stuff the right way, because I think we all need it mentally. So it felt good. The answer to your question, it, felt, it feels good that it's there. I wish I, I wish I wasn't a Jeff fan, but otherwise it feels good that, you know, it's there. <laughs> Amen on that one. Uh, we got a great question. I like this question, Melody. Well done. Uh, what's a question you wish people would ask you more often? Wow, that is a great one. I could name a hundred that I wish they would stop asking me. Um, <laughs> that they would ask me more often. Well, you, well, you really stumped me. I, I would, I, you really did make me think. I, I think that I would love people to ask me more about the power of relationships and how to build them. Because I do think it's the, it's, it's the most underserved. I just, the other thing I would say to you about this business is the most, like I said earlier, the, the you know, most successful people in this business treat it like a business and, and uh, act as entrepreneurs and everything. But, Really, the most successful people in this business have built their tribes. They've built their relationships and they've built their champions and everything like that. It is literally the most underserved part of it. I mean, I run the biggest social network for film, television, and digital creatives, and I can't tell you how many people use it wrong or don't use, utilize it in the right way or don't understand when I, you know, when they come to me and they go, you know, stage 32 has done nothing. I, this is one of my favorite things to do, by the way, at film festivals and and because this happens all the time. It's one of my great joys in life in a weird way. Um, when people come up to me at like a film festival or at a conference or after I come off stage, you know, doing something like this and they're like, you know, great talk. And yeah, I really hear what you're saying about networking and building relationships and all that. But I've been on stage 32 for five years and I've gotten nothing out of them. I'm like, oh yeah? And I take my phone and I go, what's your name? And I opened the stage 32 app and I put their name in and I go, yeah, you have been on five years. You have two contacts, me and Amanda Tony, who automatically go into your uh, second you sign up. So what do you, and you've made no posts, you've made no connections. So essentially you are the person that woke up one day and, and, you know, got, woke up, stretched in bed, looked around the room and then called your mom up and went, you know, mom, nobody offered me a job today. Nobody bought my script today. Really? That's not, like, what'd you do? I, I, nothing. Like, you know, I didn't do anything, but you know, but it's brilliant. I, everything I do is brilliant. That's the, that, that's the equivalent. Again, so you bring that to me and I sit there and go, you're not serious. You're just not serious about your career. So that's the, I, the question is, tell me more about the power of relationships and how I could do it, how I, how I can create, uh, create those relationships and win those champions and find my tribe. That would be the question. Awesome. It's a really, really good one. You did stump me there for a minute. I'm going to steal that one, Melody, and I'm going to use it. <laughs> um, we got a question from Kira, and I think this is a, a, a good callback to what you said earlier about uh, you being pulled in a lot of directions. Your creative, uh, creative chaos is that what you called it? No. Yeah, it's well, it's controlled chaos. Controlled chaos. There we go. Controlled chaos. Yeah. Nobody else would think so. <laughs> With all the projects that uh, one creative can create, how do you know what to focus on and where to put your energy? And you spoke to this a little bit. But. Yeah, but it's a great question. I mean, it, it really is. It, it just depends. I mean, look, people go on IND Pro and they'll look at a producer and, and the producer will have like 20 things in development. I like, that's not me, but I, you know, and I don't like that people do that, I, but I get, but I kind of understand why. You know, it, it takes a long time to pull a project together and it could take years and things stop and start. And like I said earlier, you know, even going into COVID, you have things put together and this is shaking it all up, not just because you can't film, but because it disrupts everybody's schedule. 
and the money people might feel like there might be a better place for their money to go, you know, as opposed to letting it just sit there while, you know, we're all waiting to figure out where we can film. So I get it. But for me, it's, I find I, you know, sometimes I have six or seven things going. I think right now, I think I have seven things going. They're very diverse though. Two of them are my things as far as writing, actually three uh, that I've written. Um, two are features that I'm producing. One is a uh, documentary that I'm producing. So they're very different. And that allows me, the prioritizing becomes easier because they're all kind of moving in their own paths. Um, the, the, the hardest three in a way are the three that I've written because what needs my attention, like I said earlier, like, you know, like the feature needed my attention until all of a sudden the TV pilot got heat. And then now the feature had to kind of go on the back burner for a minute. Not that it's not important and not that I didn't want to get it done, but I had to find the time and figure out where it fit to get it done. And, you know, a lot of people think that because I run stage 32 that I have all this time, it's the complete opposite. Stage 32 takes about, I mean, no exaggeration, 60 to 80 hours of my week every week. And it's, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. It doesn't shut you know, the, the store doesn't close. The internet's open all the time. And, uh, you know, people don't realize that. They just think like, oh, you have a staff. And I do. I have a great staff. But it but doesn't mean that my attention isn't needed all the time or that I'm not building the business all the time or I'm not taking meetings all the time or anything like that. So you just find what's important. And, you, and the thing that has the most heat sometimes becomes the most important. Like there are a lot of producers in town. I hate this. It drives me there are people in town that will say, producers that will say, uh, th like if there's a producer I'm working with right now that said, well, I can plug this into uh, my number three spot because I have, you know, two other projects. I'm like, well, what's what's going on with those projects? Well, nothing right now, but I'm really passionate about them. Well, I'm like, but, well, this one has heat. Like, we have meetings. You have any meetings on those? Like, oh, no. Well, then this should go to your number one slot. Or you can just look at it like I look at it, like this is the thing that is heat, let's go, let's go do it. Like, you know, let's go, let's go work on that. Let's go take those meetings, you know? So that's how you kind of get it done. Nice. Uh, we've got a question from Ron and uh, he's asking, in your experience, what are people missing most in their scripts? Oh, that's a really good question. There's about 50 answers to that question. I think that um, the mistakes I see in scripts the most from people who know what they're doing. So I'm, I'm going to assume for this question that formatting isn't an issue, um, you know, that you know how to write a script. I would say that the thing that I see more often than not, there's two things actually. One is falling in love with your main character to the point where the supporting characters have nothing there's you know they have no arcs they have no you know they, they're they're used as puzzle pieces or tools to get your main character somewhere else and that's a huge mistake um your supporting characters i see this all the time your supporting characters could add so much to a script and they should obviously but i mean there is so much you can do with supporting characters. They add subtext to your main character and, and subtext to, to the plot and everything. I mean, just so much. And so I, that's one problem is underdeveloped uh, secondary characters for sure. And then the second thing is um, a lot of people know how to open and close their films, but they don't, or, or their scripts, like they have the killer opening and they, or they know exactly the way they want to end it and everything like that, but they can't bridge the gap in the second act. The second act meanders all over the place. And I see that a lot. Um, where you read this unbelievable opening, you're like, wow, that's catchy. That's really cool. Great inciting incident. You know, they even know how to close act one sometimes. Like, you know, they, they really know that. And now we're going. And, but when they go to go, they're, you know, they're all over the place. So those are the two that I see very often. I'd like, uh, um, I heard somebody say once when it comes to characters, supporting characters, if as the writer you have not already in your mind or even on paper written out their own movie, their own story, then they are not complete enough yet to be in your script. I totally agree with that. And by like, you know, for me, the adventure is always for the main character. You know, the discovery 
is always with the sporting characters. And what I mean by that is, you know, I like to go into a script knowing how these sporting characters are going to grow, much like you just said, Ben. I mean, it's like, you know, I want to know what their little, like, exactly. Like, they're a movie in somebody else's movie, but if you weren't watching that somebody else's movie, would you watch that character? Because they're having their own journey. And I think that that's so important. I think that, you know, you do make discoveries with your secondary characters along the way, but the adventure or the discovery usually stems from the main character. So it's so important to kind of understand what you what you want your secondary characters, how you want them to grow or not, because that could be their arc as well. Um, and, uh, you know, how it's going to affect the main character. But once, if you understand that, then once you get into it, what, what, what it does is it opens you up for all this really kind of cool discovery for where your main character goes. And I think that brings me back to like, what's the big mistakes I see is that they spend, writers spend so much time on their main character that they almost strangle them. You know what I mean? It's almost like it's so rigid and, and you don't want that. Okay, uh, we have another question from Carly. Uh, what inspired you to create Stage 32? I mean, it's so funny because entrepreneurs always say that they, they, they create something because they identify a need, but that is the truth. I mean, the, the need was I needed it. You know, I didn't create it as, a, as strictly a business guy, like, you know, as strictly an entrepreneur. I created it because coming from a theater background, acting and then producing there was no question to me that the power in this business comes from relationships, like we talked about earlier. So at the time, the broad-based social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, and, you know, I was on Twitter. I wasn't on Facebook. I didn't like it because, you know, I was, and I was talking to a lot of people in the business who, you know, again, they were on there, they were loving it. And I was like, what are you getting out of it? Like nothing. And then I started kind of like trolling on Facebook, created a fake account and kind of like watched. And you know, all these people in the industry are talking about their babies, their salads, you know, their dogs. And nobody was talking about anything about the business. And it occurred to me that usually what happens in, usually what happens in business is if something catches on a broad level, you'll have competitors that'll come in on a broad level with a little tweak. So think, you know, Twitter uh, for Facebook and the Facebook example, think Twitter, think Instagram, uh, Pinterest for a while, Snapchat, like broad, everything is broad. What usually happens is that funnels down into niche. And what I expected to happen was that the broad based social media platforms would eventually funnel down to niche. So I wanted to be at the forefront of creating the first one for film, television and digital creatives, but I really did build it for me. I built it because, you know, I built it because I wanted to uh, have a network. You know, I wanted to meet people in the business. And I knew even back then that this world was going to be going virtual. And now, oh, my God, it's more important than ever. And um, and that's why, our uh, you know, the, the amount of traffic and the amount of people signing up for Stage 32 has never been greater in our nine-year history than it has been over the last six to eight months because people are home and they're understanding the point that, we may never go back to exactly the way it was, but filmmaking before this happened and content creation before this happening was, ha was what happened. It was happening on a broad global level. Something that was filmed here was being scored over there and they were doing editing over here. And that was happening for years. It's going to happen all the more now. And especially with the rise of like docu-series and documentary filmmaking, which I mean, I love, and I love the fact that documentary filmmaking is enjoying this, you know, I mean, it's not even a renaissance, it's just enjoying maybe the, the most rich time that we've ever had as far as, you know, great filmmakers and great storytelling on the documentary side. But a lot of these things are happening where, you know, different crews are filming in different areas and it's being, that footage is being shot to another area and it's being edited over here and, I mean, colored over here. That's just going to continue. And, and that's where, again, no connection is a bad connection. You don't need to have connections just in your neighborhood. The world, the creativity is global. It's universal. Make, make your connections all over the world and, and live in that. Like, you know, just, just luxurate in that because it, it's what matters. It really does. 
So I think we got uh, time for one more question here, and uh, that's it. I think we're. I think we won't have about <laughs> six minutes left. So it depends on the length of the answer. <laughs> oh God! Well, I, we may be here till five o'clock with the way I answer questions. It says, what is your advice to writers who have a fantastic script, but will not let a producer take the ball and run with it, where they are just well, too attached to the script and can't? I can it. answer this one. We can add, we can go right to the next question on this one. Producer yourself. Learn how to produce. Like, again, I mean, look, I'm not being snide. I'm not being, you know, trying to be a smart ass, although I'm very good at that. Um, the reality of the situation is, look, you, you, could eat, you could be one of, one of two types of writers, really, right? You could be the person that only wants to write and sell. And if that's you and you want to write and sell, then you just got to understand that you're relinquishing control the second that you sell that script. Somebody could rewrite you, you know, your name could come off of it down the road. It could happen. But if you're fine with that and you got paid and you can move on to the next thing, that's fine. That's one type of writer. If you are the type of writer that is so concerned that your words are going to be changed and that, you know, they're going to, even after you get paid, it's, you know, that thing's going to hit the screen and it might be written by somebody else and story by you, then you need to learn how to control what you can control for as long as you can control it, which means that, you hire your own producer, okay? You raise your own money. You find your own actors. You know what I mean? You you package it together the best that you can and take it as far as you can to the point where you have a producer and a director on board that says, you know what? We'll never change a word of this thing. You brought us in. But to do that, you need contacts. And to do that, you need connections. And to do that, you need relationships. And to do that, you need champions. And to do that, you need to have a proving ground that you're not just like every other writer. You need people that are going to read it and see something special in it, okay? And this is the path that I keep talking about. And this is the reality that I keep talking about. You know what I mean? This TV pilot I'm, I'm pitching again, I know full well that I can't be the showrunner on the show. Not because I don't know this world better than anybody. I do. I researched it. Nobody knew about it. It's true. It's based on facts. But that got me in the door to everybody else. Okay. But I've never run a show before. So a network's not going to go here. RB, here's freaking the satchels of money. Go run this show when you've never done it before. Not going to do it. What they will do, because I brought the showrunner and because I brought the producer and everything like that, is they will make me a lead writer on that show. This guy will run the show and I will be his 1A. That they'll do. Okay. And I understand that. And I'm not precious about that. I'm not running in there going like, no, but I should be the showrunner. I don't care about his experience. I know it better than anybody. What he's basically saying is I won't do the show without RB because he knows it better than anybody. I don't know this story. Like, you know what I mean? But we'll work together to get it. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's you got to understand your place. You got to understand how the business works and you can't be precious about anything. So if you are precious about it and you don't want your words changed and you don't want to be that writer that just sells, then you need to have those connections and that power that comes from having those connections that you could bring more assets to the party. Great answer. There, I got a cute one from Kira. Do you ever get starstruck yet or in the business? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, before this, I ran a magazine called Razor, which was a men's lifestyle magazine. It was national. So I, so we competed against like GQ and Esquire and, and Maxim and all those. I hate saying Maxim because we used to joke that we were the magazine when you're done with your Maxim years and not ready for your Esquire years. So that's kind of the middle ground that we filled. But by virtue of running this magazine for six years, I met pretty much every celebrity you could think of. And you'd be surprised at who were the assholes and you'd be surprised at who were the sweetest in the world. And by the way, usually the bigger they were, the sweeter they were be honest with you, usually the C-list and D-list that we're not even around anymore, who, you know, uh, were like, you know, we need a trailer and we need it. I'd be like, no, you get a sandwich and a chair. Um, so you meet a lot of people. I don't necessarily think that I've met, um, I don't necessarily, think, I, I, you know, maybe I've been starstruck by a couple, like I, you know, meeting Scorsese, you know, was, of course, for me, it's just that thing. I'm a New York Times guy, so of course. And I obviously love his movies. Um, that was a moment. But it's funny, like, I met De Niro at the same event, and it was sort of like, okay. Like, it's just weird. Like, you get to a point where you meet so many of these people um, and so many celebrities that you kind of, you just realize that a lot of them are very insecure, and a lot of them, um, you know, the, you know, it's, it's the one leg at a time kind of thing. You know, we all put our pants on the same way. 
and everything like that. That's not to say I wouldn't get starstruck by a few other ones if, along the way. Um, but I think I'm more, I, I think it's less starstruck than it is awed by the talent and awed by the output. And I don't think there's been one time, like when I met Scorsese, it wasn't like, oh my God. It was more like, tell me why. Tell me why you did that. Like, tell me why you made that choice. Like, tell me, you know, why didn't you do that? Like having a knowledge base, like that movie that you were attached to that never got made, why did you not make it? And like, you know, and so that they're like, sort of like, wow, shit, he knows what he's talking about. Like that's, that's you know, the, the kind of angle that I always try to come from because I'm always just awed by uh, the talent and, and, and the career. Well, I think we're at the end of our, our finish line here, my friend. Uh, Is that it? That's it. So uh, I just want to say uh, on behalf of the creative community, because uh, I get to represent them right now, uh, thank you for elevating creatives all across the world. Thank you pr for providing Stage 32 as a service. Thank you for providing your time today. And thank you for being a mentor to me personally. Um, wow. Thank you, uh, Melody and Carly and Kira and especially Ivan for uh, hosting us today. And we will see you all in the trenches. Oh, can I, can I just say thank you to everybody as well? And, uh, you know, obviously Ivan and Melody and Kira and, and Carly and you, Ben, of course. And to everybody that watched, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Ben, I want to, your planet looks beautiful. Uh, thank you for being a friendly people. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it seems like, you know, uh, it seems like a nice place to visit. So it's a, oxygen's the only issue. It, uh, well, but you can go mass free. <laughs> well, maybe, then maybe, then maybe not oxygen's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, oh, I am not supposed to sign out. This is for somebody smarter than me to be doing. <laughs> and I'm supposed to stay on, right? Goodbye. Oh. Love you. <laughs> Goodbye, Pete. Goodbye, everyone. Oh, see us on stage. Three. Can I throw out also stage32.com. RB walks into a bar on Twitter and Instagram, always putting out amazing content. Uh, yeah, that's it. And follow my dog. Romo walks into a bar on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> All right.